Ding. Like Tesla. Think like Tesla. Micah here. So happy to be with you. And today we're going to look at something called a Schumann wave generator, or some call it a resonator. You can find these on a lot of the e-commerce sites for a dozen bucks or so. Here's a picture of one. That is a cool looking coil. That's the thing that really catches your eye, first of all, about these. It just looks cool. But what does it do? Well, what it does tends to depend a lot on the creative writing skills of the merchant, but uh, it produces an extremely low frequency, 7.83, uh, offsets the frequency of negative interference. Yeah, that's clear. Um, Makes the sound space reservation stable and harmonious, allowing listeners to enjoy music more concentrated and enjoyable. It can improve the human body's perception of sound and images. This one here has a little bit more flowery description for the bedroom to help sleep, soothe the nerves, treatment of insomnia. For the office, relax and improve work efficiency. For the create space to improve creative inspiration. All right, I think we get the picture. It's one of these woo-woo devices. You plug it in and good stuff is somehow supposed to happen. But why? Why would people think that's even the case? And what's the deal with 7.83 hertz and what's Schumann resonance anyway? Well, to talk about that, we are going to uh, take a step back and talk about the Earth for a minute. Now here I am using Excalidraw. Appreciate these guys putting their drawing surface up on for free on the web. Very cool. Okay, so let's talk about the Earth. So the Earth is an oblate spheroid. It is more or less a conductor. Some parts of it conduct better than others. But overall, you can generally think of the Earth, surface of the Earth as a conductor. And you can generally think of the atmosphere around it as an insulator. And then at the very top of the atmosphere, there's a layer called the, I, the ionosphere. And due to solar and other effects, it is more or less also a conductor. It's different on the day side versus the night side. It's affected by all kinds of different things. But more or less at a, at a 50,000 foot scale, literally, um, we can think of this as a conductor. So this looks a little bit like a capacitor, doesn't it? You got an insulating dielectric, you got conductors on both sides. Unlike pretty much any other capacitor you're gonna run into, you will not find that you are physically inside of it between the two plates. So that's a little bit different. Also, the size is just kind of different. This is very big. It's about an eighth of a light second for photons ricocheting off of here to make a complete circuit all the way around. And within the dielectric here, there's a lot of stuff going on. Probably about 100 lightning strikes per second, all kinds of thunderstorm activity, Almost all radio signals emitted by humans are within this narrow little envelope. So what we're really looking at here is almost like a uh, spherical shell waveguide. Now radio waves like to go through insulators that can propagate freely through ins insulators. And if a radio wave comes to a conducting surface, it's going to tend to reflect. So that's why you get a circulation effect going here. Take a table, put a bunch of metronomes on it, and have them all ticking at their own pace. Because there's just enough mechanical coupling between the metronomes, eventually they will synchronize. So something similar over time happens with all the different radio frequency things happening on the Earth, and you end up with a 7.83 hertz uh, signal that with the right equipment you can detect. There are harmonics of that too, and it's not exactly 7.83, it varies depending on all kinds of different conditions and other things going on. So Mother Earth, she's pretty complicated, but very cool. So somehow the theory is, if you have a device emitting frequencies in tune, uh, you guys can't see the huge finger quotes I was just making there, um, in tune with Mother Earth, somehow that makes you enjoy music more. Hey, I didn't write that. Um, all right, I wanted to take a look at some of the some of the details of this coil here. The coil was the really cool thing. 
Now it's about 50 turns. It's about three inches edge to edge. And the spacing and the wiring was about equal. So that would be 375 micrometers each outer diameter. And if you plug these in, we get a rating of between 53 and 69 microhenries, which seems about right. And I stuck an ohmmeter on it, and I got a DC resistance of about 8 ohms. So you end up, I, I traced out the whole circuit too, and you end up with a, something that looks like this. And there's some really odd things in this circuit too. So it's got reverse polarity protection. It's got a standard 555 circuit. This is a multi-turn potentiometer. You can really dial in the exact frequency. It's got a bunch of capacitors buffering the overall circuit. And ultimately, so the output pin here is a square wave at 7.83 hertz. It is turning on the transistor, and the transistor is turning on a MOSFET, and the MOSFET is just cramming the, the rail to ground on, off, on, off, 7.83 times a second. This seems like a bad thing, but just the internal resistance here, just the 8 ohms alone, is, will limit the current a lot. And then there are inductive effects of trying to switch a square wave through there. So your USB will be fine. It will, it will kind of work. It seems a bit over-engineered for something that's basically just a woo-woo device, though, doesn't it? I mean, why do you, do you really need two stages of transistors on this thing? You really need a driver for that MOSFET gate? I don't know. And get a load of this. The on-off switch here switches the LED off. That's it. All, the whole rest of the circuit keeps on plugging along. But the... Uh, LED will turn off, if that makes you happy. So we could run the circuit here in the simulator and see it's doing its thing. We can look at some of these waveforms. So output voltage, the inductor, already looking at the current through the inductor, and the voltage across the inductor might have some ringing effects on it. Might be hitting some of the limitations of the uh, simulator here, but we'll see. I don't know. Okay, back to this pancake coil. Eight ohms of resistance? It seemed like uh, kind of a lot to me. Does that meet the sniff test? Okay, let's see. Eight, ohm, uh, eight ohms. How long is this coil? So if it's... 3 inches diameter, 3 times pi is about 9.42. There's 50 turns. The outermost turn gives us that full 9.42 inches, but as the turns go towards the center, they get smaller and smaller, basically down to zero. So the average is half of that. So plug that in a wolf from alpha, and we get 19.62 feet in freedom units. Just a tiny hair under 6 meters of a PCB trace. So kind of longer than, than you might think. Does, does that still pass the sniff test? Okay, eight ohms for 20 feet. 160 ohms for 200 feet. 300. It's about 400 ohms per thousand feet, right? So in our wire gauge chart here. That would be 36 gauge wire. It's pretty small, but if you it was pounded completely flat, would it look about like that? Probably seems about right. And we can also plug this into the PCB trace analyzer. Here's our 0.375 again. Here's the length. And we'll say it's probably one ounce. It's probably standard one ounce copper. And that calculates right around to 8 ohms. So yeah, that does seem to pass our sniff test here. So cool little circuit. Uh, it's fun to build, fun to have around. I think a larger model of it would look fantastic on the movie set of a mad scientist. Might need something a little more flashy than a single blinky LED, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't do anything, but it's cool. So have a look at that and uh, keep on thinking like Tesla. Now, you guys are all contrarians, so if you really like this, be sure not to hit that subscribe button 
and uh, do not hit the little bell to notify you when this video comes out and to train the AI so you can see more content like this. Definitely don't do that. All right, take care guys, over and out.